to talk about a little bit about my trajectory as an artist and the kinds of things I think about. Um, um, and so we'll just start and again, don't hesitate. Um, I, as I said last night, I sort of uh, am obsessed with anatomical, uh, you know, the anatomy in the body, uh, with fairy tales and stories of childhood, um, collective narrative methods and techniques and graphic and narrative medicine. And as I said, they look like they're completely unrelated subjects. Um, and from the outside, they might seem that way. And certainly they all have separate communities that are embedded with them um, very actively. But I do see connective threads between them, very much so. And I do think that even more so now, as we move into this world post-pandemic, or hopefully post-pandemic, and we start thinking about the role of storytelling as we think about our interconnected interconnectivity. And also I do think that the world in many ways, and I think that, you know, generations that are not mine, younger generations, certainly think in terms uh, that are more uh, interdisciplinary. And a lot of the traditional mechanisms that we have about being a certain role in the world don't necessarily fit. And I'm excited by that. So um, I'll start with the anatomical work. This is a piece that's actually in the show. And this is, this is the oldest piece in the show. Um, I made it around 2016. I was living uh, in Shanghai and the air quality index went up to about 500. And um, you know, like everybody, when suddenly it feels like there's an environmental thing that's out of control, I panicked a bit. And one thing that I noticed was that, you know, the first time the air quality had gone up to let's say 170, uh, my ears hurt, my throat hurt. I felt kind of icky. I went up to 500 for a few days and then it settled back down and suddenly 170, 230, didn't seem so bad. And so I started thinking about the body's, you know, uh, flexibility and our ability to adjust and when it's good and when it's not good. And also around the respiratory system because it is like, you know, a, a, an automatic function, but we certainly have the capacity to control our own breath, to focus on our breath, to think about how we breathe and interact. And so, um, and so, I started to sort of investigate this. And the first form that I looked at was the anatomical flat book. This is one of the earliest forms of movable books um, and, you know, and how scientific and uh, information was conveyed. Um, and then because I was living in China, I got really interested in paper cutting, which I had never previously done. And so these are taken from uh, antique autopsy photographs. Um, these are not healthy organs in the photograph. And as I said last night, I'm very interested in animation. Uh, and so I want to include an animated component. Um, and in that, um, I was thinking about projection mapping and what it means to sort of take something like the respiratory system and project it onto a surface. Um, and sort of think about these three pieces in relationship to each other uh, as they're presented and thinking about high tech and low tech and how to mix these sort of different forms together. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned last night, I uh, this is a closed edition body of work. Uh, I think this, this one piece just exists as one exhibition copy, but the flat book, there's five copies of it and uh, same with the paper cuts. And, I think like many people, I'm interested in the making of things, but then making the exact replicas over time doesn't interest me so much as a practice. But you know, it's something that if you're a book artist, you do make additions and you think about how to make multiples. That's sort of what you do. Um, and at the same time too, one thing that I do feel sadly about when you have a closed edition body of work is that um, it doesn't exist after the last copy is sort of sold or gone. And so um, these pieces, you know, are in collections. And the only copy that exists right now is the one that's currently in, in your space. That's my exhibition copy. Um, and that's all there is. And, you know, and so one's relationship to the, your work and to collections, um, it can be complex. And I really like the idea of, of people having access to work. And I really like to consider the questions of who gets to see work, where do they see artwork, and the many, many, many ways in which art is created. I mean, I think that often we have a narrative around showing your work in galleries, and that's a very important narrative, absolutely. But there's millions of ways in which art is made in the world, in which it's exhibited in the world. I, I'm really interested in community-based practice and relational practices in other types of things, and not necessarily just the commercial art world. In fact, that interests me very little or least of all in many respects. Um, and so um, 
what I started to do earlier this year, especially because with the pandemic, I had all these exhibitions lined up. I had I had I had plans, uh, and like everyone, my plans were completely um, sort of destroyed. And so I started to think about well we're online, what does that mean? How do we sort of mail things to each other? What exists instead? And I start to think about open edition work and really open edition kinds of cards, things that are really sort of easy to assemble, easy to 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 make, um, because they don't all have to be absolutely identical and purpose uh, perfect. They're fun for me to make, right? I sit and I could watch TV or binge watch something or listen to podcasts and just cut away. And it's really relaxing for me to do. The illustrations are based on antique medical books as well. Um, and really thinking again, just how uh, how these uh, paper techniques can be used in this way. And similarly with paper cuts, just really simple kinds of cuts. And some of these are machine cuts on my, my silhouette. I mean, that's a thing about the crafting world, which I think I mentioned in Tuesday night's class, you know, the, the craft world and the stamping world and, and all of that has created amazing tools in the past few, you know, a couple of, 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 of decades. And so what used to be sort of a very expensive way to work if you want to have access to to a vinyl cutter and, and you know create these kinds of forms, um, now comes in a machine that's $200 and can interface with your laptop. And that's really remarkable that you have this, this, this flexibility. And so, you know, with when my, my museum shows and gallery shows sort of got canceled this year, I looked at Etsy and I looked at other ways to, to sort of, you know, how to sort of exchange work, how to do virtual fairs, all sorts of things. And there are wonderful, amazing communities of people out there engaging. And I don't, I think, Several years ago, people would have thought of them as being very separate. And I do see them as being much more continuous now in terms of a lot of people's thinking. Um, similarly, um, in terms of fairy tales, uh, this is uh, the prototype for my Struvel Peter uh, book, which I guess was exhibited last year um, uh, at, uh, at the gallery. Um, and so, as I mentioned last night, uh, I had made a series of handmade editioned books based on Heinrich Kaufmann's Struvel Peter. Heinrich Kaufmann was a psychologist in the 19th century, and he wrote this book for his son uh, in response to what he perceived as being a lack of good literature for children. Uh, in these are cautionary tales for children, in which all the children basically, you know, suffer dire consequences for their misbehavior, comically so. So if you don't eat your soup, you starve to death and die. If you go out in the rain with your umbrella, the wind will carry you away, and no one will hear your screams and cries, and no one will ever see you again. They're really big, super traumatic stories, um, and they became very popular. They became extremely popular with both adults and children. If you ask anybody who grew up with them, they will probably mention that, you know, they were traumatized by them in childhood. Um, so when I made these handmade books and they had different forms, carousel books, accordion books, um, tunnel books, uh, I start to think again about, you know, how can I make this in a way that um, other people might be able to see? Um, and so um, this was a prototype that I demoed at, um, at uh, Maker Faire back in 2016, I think it was, um, and just really to sort of gauge people's opinions on, you know, do you like having electronics? Do you want to have animation in it? What do you think about it? Just getting a lot of feedback from adults and kids alike. And then I um, kickstarted it. Um, and so uh, on Kickstarter, I think I raised about $46,000 just for the production cost, as well as customs and shipping and all that. All the money raised went directly into making the book. And, you know, I have to admit, it was a very, very daunting process. I had never made a book for, you know, production before ever. I would wake up in the middle of the night terrified, thinking, what, it, like, who am I to work with a factory? This is, this is, this is, you know, bigger than I am. Um, and it was very daunting. But the fortunate thing was that I'd been living and working in China at the time. So I got to visit factories and I went with a friend um, and really sort of got to see how things were made, um, you know, just what factories looked like, because there's a lot, there's a lot of um, uh, definition around factory and factory life and what that might mean. And really got to choose a factory that I felt comfortable with in every way. Um, and so I worked with Topan, which is located in Guangzhou, and they were incredibly kind and very patient with me. And, would send, and the whole thing was done back and forth through email. So, um, you know, in Adobe Illustrator, just sending files back and forth, and then they would send me a prototype and a test, and then I would, you know, everything was done through 
through uploading files. Um, and so what I did here was, as I mentioned, I took all the original artwork and I reconceived it. So each book was a separate spread. Um, and so I wouldn't make anyone angry who might have, you know, have another copy of it, but they would see it as something different. And it is something completely different. Um, and then in terms of the animation, um, what I found was that uh, my my idea was to have an LCD screen um, embedded in the back of the book. And I made animations for each of the stories. And then what I found was that the costs for that were just astronomical to do. And hardware is really hard and really, really expensive. So what I did was I decided to create an AR app and I uh, collaborated with a colleague, Kadala Burroughs, to make the app. And, um, and so, how it works, and I'll just sort of run through the app. And I think the app was at the gallery last year. Um, so, you know, the book is a pretty traditional pop-up book and I designed it so that um, you wouldn't look at any page and think anything is missing. You know, it's not like you think, oh, there's some content missing on this page. Um, there isn't. And each page again, so this one was a carousel book. This was a series of paper cuts that now is, you know, uh, my favorite waterfall mechanism. Um, but then when you hold your phone up to the book and to the whole page, the whole page is a marker, you can um, play an animated version of each story on each page. And so um, it's just another level and the, the app is available on both Google Play and on the App Store. Um, I'll just let it play a little more. And I composed music for seven out of the 10 stories. The other three stories have music composed by Itai Benjamin, who's an amazing musician. Um, and again, so, and each page had a different spread. Um, and again, hold your phone up. Um, so this was actually a sort of interesting sort of selling point for the book. People were so excited about the AR app. And then, um, and I spent a lot of time working on the AR. And then what I found was that um, when I looked at the stats, not that many people were downloading the AR app. In fact, I think most people don't actually want to hold a book and their phone at the same time. If you're holding an art object or a book, you want to experience that separately. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it, and I would talk to friends who are even in technology, people who do game development say, hey, did you download the app? And I'm like, no, was I supposed to? Because they think of books as being an object that you hold and your phone as being something else. Um, but I'm still, it still works and I'm still happy and proud of it. Um, and this has led to um, the current book that's there, um, which is I started working with nursery rhymes, um, you know, because we have them throughout our childhood. And we don't really think much about them, but they are ominous. And I think that fairy tales, as I, as I mentioned last night, you know, these sorts of we have these ideas of safe stories for children, and uh, and and fairy tales are the exact opposite. And these kinds of stories are the exact opposite, but they serve a very important role. Um, children know that the world isn't safe. Children know that there's injustice. Uh, they know all sorts of things. And and fairy tales give us a space in which we can sort of really explore very sort of big themes, abandonment, loss, death, and also get taught these sort of um, um, lessons of like, well, if you persevere, you know, you can, you can triumph, right? And they're, the way stories work is really that they, 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 they are without psychology, they're event by event, and our characters are good or evil, or, you know, they're, they're very, very sort of general characteristics. Um, and so this sort of navigation to the space that does feel somewhat threatening gives us actually a way to sort of process the world in a way that that is helpful to us. And, and so nursery rhymes, when we start thinking about them, they're sort of presented as this kind of these, these safe little happy stories for children. But when you really listen to them, they're not. So in this case, when you start thinking about Georgie Porgy putting in a pie, kissed the girls and made them cry, you know, clearly it's, 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 you know, sexually inappropriate behavior. He's a predator. Um, when you start looking at the story of Peter, Peter Pumpkin Eater, that actually is about a man who did kill his wife, who was working as a prostitute, the old woman who lived in the shoe. It's about child abuse. So these are pretty deep and, and, and kind of awful themes. And so what I wanted to do was really sort of place them in the context of the 21st century and really look at just that as a piece. Um, this book, although I, I sent it um, 
has animations that accompany it. And so they're on, I imagine they're on the display near the book, but the editioned version, there's 10, actually has a little sort of flat LCD screen that accompanies it. Um, I debuted this work uh, at this piece at Art on Paper in March of last year. Uh, Art on Paper, New, New York was the last city to cancel, did, actually New York did not cancel any of its art fairs um, and uh, the rest of the world did. And so we had the Armory Show and Art on Paper and all these shows uh, the first weekend of March of 2020. And then three days later, the city started to go, all the schools closed and the city started to go into lockdown. Uh, so it was a very nerve wracking event because you know I was in a pier with thousands of people and everyone was terrified or wondering why we were doing this. Um, but um, so I'm at the stage now, what my summer plan is with this to try and figure out a way to make this an affordable version of it. Like what would it mean to make an accessible version? And I don't know if you have any ideas. I open it up for discussion. If you can think about ways in which, I mean, I've thought about, do I make them as cards? Do I make a downloadable version? That's an ebook version that people can print and assemble themselves. I don't know. And that's sort of a, a plan for this summer to think about. Um, oops. Okay. Um, this piece here also debuted at Art on Paper and it's a piece entitled uh, The Person You Don't Want to Be. And um, so, I was frustrated about around about workplace dynamics and politics and that kind of thing. And um, so I started keeping a list of personality types I would encounter at meetings. Um, and and I came up with a sort of comprehensive list. And this sort of goes into my collective practices work. I then um, sent out this list of friends and said, why don't you pick a personality type that resonates with you? And by the way, if you see me moving, it's because a cat has decided they have to be on top of me right now. I'm trying to keep them off screen. Um, so I sent them out to friends and colleagues who I felt like either resonated with the idea for whatever reason, or had some kind of performative streak and asked them if they wanted to pick a personality type, record themselves somehow doing some kind of gesture or action that embodies that and send it to me. And so they all recorded themselves on their phones or whatever, sent them to me. I then took anywhere from eight to 14 frames that I rotoscoped, and then I made them into two different things. I made them into animations as well as uh, uh, paper um, uh, pull tab books. And so um, this is Mickey as the bully, um, Joyce as the silent and uncomfortable bystander, uh, Sandra as the explainer, and then, oh, come on, keyboard, <laughs> okay. I made them using that same pull tab that I just showed, and this is the closed edition set. The closed edition set contains 21 cards that are in a box that you can sort of just each one sort of interact with. And I like this mechanism a lot for the reasons that I feel like it just really lends itself to almost flip book animation. And then um, I made a swatch book and the swatch book is really sort of easy to assemble. It's open edition, et cetera. And I made an app to accompany it. And so if you have the swatch book, you can just hold your phone up. Um, and this is at art on paper. So that's the silent and delighted bystander. Um, uh, there's Joyce again as a silent and uncomfortable bystander. Uh, I'm my goodness, I can't remember what this personality is. <laughs> okay, oh, there is me as the inert with self interest, um, Elliot as the schemer. And just to give you a little sort of technical frame for how I did it, uh, I used a game engine called Unity. Uh, Unity, I don't know if any of you have any experience working with game engines. Um, Unity basically is used for developing 3D worlds in and, and games. There's another uh, platform, Unreal Engine, which is also very popular. Uh, Unity uh, has, a, has a plugin called Euphoria, uh, which basically allows you to set up markers uh, on objects and then link them to files. So this is basically the Unity game engine um, um, uh, 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 screen and I'm down at the bottom and I'm sort of play testing. I'm okay, testing so out I'm testing uh, my prototype, which is just on uh, different pieces of paper. And so as I hold up, 
it sees the marker and the marker in this case is the actual photograph each person or the actual is illustration each illustration is established as a separate marker um, as opposed to in the struble peter book where it's the entire page the silent and delighted bystander okay and so this is me late at night testing it <laughs> and i'll pause it for a moment um so uh, this, because it also happened right before COVID sort of stopped at this point, um, my current work right now is developing in the game platform and game engine can be a lot of fun and getting it onto your phone is not so difficult when you're working this way. Getting it onto everybody else's phone is where it becomes complicated because you have to basically have it approved by the Apple, uh, by the App Store and by Google Play. Google Play is actually quite easy. The App Store is not. And so my plan for the next couple of weeks is try to get it approved on the App Store. Um, and it's been, it has been rejected for reasons that have to do with um, the fact that it's an art object and not like a book in a store, like there's all sorts of like things that I have to clarify in, in the page for, for them to understand what it is. Um, that it's so, I've, if you look at the web page for it, I've had to include a sample of how it works so that if you um, have the app, you could test it in your browser window without having to buy the book first. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of um, back and forth that I'm having with the app store. Okay, and let me move forward. Um, and then this piece, as I talked about last night, I won't go too much further into this piece, um, but well, I, maybe I will. I'm not sure who was there last night. So uh, mouth and toes, as I said, in 2013, I was creating a class in paper arts uh, for NYU Shanghai. I just moved there and I was really looking at the history of paper folding, paper cutting, et cetera, across the planet because there's a tradition everywhere in the world. Um, and uh, when I came to sort of looking at American paper cuts um, and silhouettes in particular, I discovered the work of Martha Ann Honeywell and as well as um, uh, uh, Saunders Nellis, who's at the bottom there. And so, as I said, in the first part of the 20th century, when silhouettes became an incredibly popular form of affordable portraiture, um, Artists basically, and this was across the board, took advantage of the technologies that were available to them that were newly available, the railway. So they were able to travel from city to city on their own and uh, the press, they would take out ads for themselves. Um, and among them were three artists that I sort of stumbled upon, again, uh, not, uh, not Saunders Nellis, Martha Ann Honeywell and Sally Rogers, who was also known as Sarah Rogers. And I, I was, there was a little information about them generally online, but not much. Um, and so I sort of bookmarked it as an idea that I wanted to um, explore. And I basically submitted a proposal to the American Antiquarian Society in 2019 because they have an extensive collection of uh, silhouette paper cuts, including works by uh, all three. And so um, last, again, I thought I was going to be in the archive. Uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts. I thought I'd be handling these precious paper cuts. And instead I did it from home and online. The librarians were incredibly helpful. They basically sent me all sorts of digital files. If there were things that weren't digital, for instance, the picture on the right-hand side, one of the librarians literally went through a book and took photographs and sent me the photographs since I couldn't hold the book in my hand. Um, and so I started to think about the story of these artists. And in the meantime, I discovered the work of historian Laurel Dean who started publishing work about Martha Ann Honeywell um, around 2015, 2016. And she's sort of the foremost authority on Martha Ann Honeywell, who was really extraordinary. She was an artist who um, was way ahead of her time. She had no arms. She had one foot with three toes. And as I said, was a master paper cutter, um, was a, a embroiderer and calligrapher. Uh, she managed her own career. She traveled not only across the United States, but also across Europe. Um, she and And she wrote her own advertisements in many ways, very carefully sort of describing the wonder of her performance and the atypical nature of her body. And at the same time too, when people would arrive, because what she would often do is rent a room that had all her work set up and then have another room in which she would basically perform and cut people's portraits and engage with people. People would leave, they would come for the spectacle, but would leave feeling that they had been the presence of, as they would say, of a lady and of an artist. And, uh, and she was extraordinarily successful. 
Um, and so Laurel and I decided to collaborate on this. And I wrote to Laurel, as I said, a beautiful, you know, sort of some, some things that have been surprising around COVID have been certainly about people's willingness to engage with each other electronically online. And when I wrote to Laurel to thank her for her research, we decided that we would work together on this. And so talking about book structures and um, this piece, I decided really should be in the form of something that was traditional to its time. At the time, moving panoramas were a very, very, in the upper left-hand corner, very, very popular form of entertainment. Um, and down in the lower left-hand corner, as I mentioned yesterday, I discovered the Cranky Movement, the American Cranky Movement, which I did not know existed. Um, but there is, there's a large school of people who basically perform cranky devices based on, on the moving panorama. Um, and so I found all these tutorials online and, uh, and, uh, and again, like the paper engineering world, a, a community of people who are incredibly open about sharing information, about sharing resources, about being incredibly enthusiastic about other people's work. Um, and so I decided to make a Cranky. Um, you can use, it's in the space, so any of you who are interested can navigate through and, and turn the dials and please do it carefully, <laughs> um, but um, can interact with the book itself. It is designed to be interacted with. And so it tells the story um, in chat. The first half is just sort of an introduction to the world of those artists. And the second half begins with the Peel Museum. Charles Wilson Peel established the first museum in the United States in Philadelphia. And it was one of the first sort of collections. He was a portrait painter of uh, he was both a portrait painter and a naturalist. He was interested in the natural world, so he basically wanted to combine the arts and scientific exploration. Uh, he had a performative sort of space or where people would come to see curiosities, and all these artists performed in this space. Uh, similarly, there's a huge number of uh, paper cut silhouettes that are attributed to the Peel Museum, which in 1995 were discovered to be the work of Moses Williams. Moses Williams was the former slave or former enslaved person of Charles Wilson Peel. His parents had been emancipated, but he had to, he, under the law, was raised in the um, Peel household with Peel's other children, Rembrandt, Raphael, etc. All of Peel's children were named after his favorite painters. And what happened with Moses Williams is uh, he was trained on the Physiana Trace. And so if you look at book two, the story of Moses Williams appears, um, and which is a device in which you could trace someone's silhouette and then it would enlarge it and then, um, and then you could uh, cut it out from there. And he was incredibly gifted and adept both at using the Physiana Trace and as an artist. Um, and in his first year at the Peel Museum, as the resident silhouette paper cutter, he apparently uh, cut over 900 silhouettes, was emancipated a year early by Charles Wilson Peel, and also um, was able to get married and married the former cook of the Peel household who was white, and he had not been able to sit in the same room with her or eat with her while he was uh, enslaved. And he uh, bought a three-story brick building a home in, in Philadelphia. Uh, his story is just a portion of this, only as it relates to the Peel Museum. I think it actually is deserves its own book. But it is important to note that these artists basically made their career, started their career at the Peel Museum. But Peel really built his fame and credibility on the labor of these artists. And, um, and so their career was very short lived in many ways because when we see P.T. Barnum enter and purchase the museum's holdings, uh, those artists became known specifically for their performative aspects. The freak show emerged. Uh, Nella Saunders would also play the cello and shoot an arrow. And they were less known as artists and they lost financial autonomy. But try and focus, this book is really about the, their trajectory as artists. And one fact that has been revealed in this book that is not yet known in the world, but Laurel wrote it into this book, was that uh, Martha Ann Honeywell was married. Uh, she married a, a, a man, Mr. Baggage, I think is his name. And so we reveal that in this story. Um, similarly, I wanted to include, and you have them on a screen here, how mouth and toe artists work, because they do to this day. <laughs> They're mouth and toe artists everywhere in the world. And so um, these are uh, short animations, very much like the animations in the um, person you don't want to be, short loopable animations that then also um, as, uh, oops, come on, um, 
that I wanted to represent in a form that was familiar for the time. And so mutoscopes were very like, moving picture machines would allow you to crank and flip through a series of pictures. And so um, I use this flip book model. This is actually a kit. These kits come, um, were also kickstarted. So this, if you ever want to self-publish or do anything, you will find that the Kickstarter community actually is incredibly generous. Um, people really do share information readily with each other about how to do campaigns. There's a huge world of publishing online, in particular comics. So the stigma of self-publishing doesn't really exist and anymore in many, many ways. And these traditional outlets for you know, getting your work out into the world um, have, have, um, are disappearing and have been disappearing rapidly. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about graphic medicine and how I sort of came to um, the other piece that was in uh, exhibited last year. And this is a project called Our Hysterectomies. Um, so in 2017, I found out that I needed to have a full abdominal hysterectomy as soon as possible. And I had my life completely planned because I was teaching in New York and I was teaching in Shanghai and I was doing this thing. And, and so suddenly I had to disclose to everybody because I had to end things early. I had to start things late and I had to be in the hospital in two weeks time. Um, and so what I found was when I was um, disclosing to everybody uh, and I had friends who basically had been through the procedure before me, but hadn't said a word to anybody. I found that everybody sort of was very incredibly supportive, but also would talk to me in a tone that was very much like this as they told me about another family member. And I just kept thinking if this was my knee, nobody would ever be talking to me with this tone. So what does this tone mean? And so when I woke up in the hospital, I posted this photograph on social media, both on Facebook and Instagram in a very uncharacteristic personal and political act. I woke up feeling great. I felt lousy four days later, but in that moment, I jumped off the gurney. I ate two dinners. I was sort of in this like, you get screw the patriarchy. I don't care. I'm taking. And then I was really shocked by this, the, the the responses where I got something like 329 comments on on the picture. And it's not like I have that many friends. And but what really stunned me was that um, all these people responded, "Oh, that happened to me. It'll get better." Um, definitely can relate, um, you know, and like if you look in the lower hand corner, so with you on this, mine was over three, six weeks ago. And that was what stunned me that basically I knew people who, a, a couple of people just between two to six weeks earlier had gone through the same procedure, but hadn't posted anything. So it really got me thinking about what are the stories that we share online publicly? What are the narratives that we craft for a public story what are the stories that we don't tell and what is the stigma attached to those stories right and how do and why do we have this stigma so um you know at the time um i found out i was going to 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 be hospitalized um and because because I'm an artist, I just decided I'm going to take pictures of everything. And I made my sister take pictures of everything because I thought I'll use this somehow. I don't know what or how, but I will just use it. So I started documenting everything as I went. And, um, and so then that summer, I decided to illustrate my story. Um, and then I put it away. And as I start to think about it, and then I wrote to everybody that I knew and said, hey, do you want to share your story? Um, with me. And if you do, I can illustrate it or you can illustrate it yourself or send me photographs, however you want. My prom I had no set prompts on this. Um, I really just thought everyone's story was so personal that they would probably respond however they wanted to. And what struck me was really that people did write their story however they wanted to. So Julie's story really struck me because she, you know, obviously it was much, it was 20 years earlier. Um, but she writes, you know, I was 47. I was separated from my husband with a divorce pending. My mother, the lover of my life had passed away. And I thought, wow, she is so candid because you would look at this and you would think I'm being very candid. But the truth is I wasn't. I'm trained as an artist. I've drawn myself a million times in the course of my life. Drawing myself in a hospital gown is kind of the equivalent of drawing this container of glue, right? But I didn't talk about how I felt. I'd gone, I was going through a major breakup myself. I didn't write about any of that. I talked about nothing and other people, she, was entirely about what her emotional state was and what her personal life was at that moment. Um, and people shared different things. People were very comfortable sending me photographs of their stitches, of their tumors, um, of their own journals. Um, one person on the left, she, um, she basically just sent me her email correspondence. When she found out she needed to have surgery, she um, wrote to a group of her friends and then just basically sent me all the correspondence 
um, sent me, Air Lover Support Network sent me pictures of them and then notations about them. So, you know, on the left you see um, A, the 28 year old who researched and found my surgeon. She's a VIP in my story. Young people really know how to research the shit out of anything, you know? And so everyone responded very differently. Um, the person on the left here uh, basically had surgery two weeks before me and she was a photographer. So she photographed her recovery out of her, uh, she had flown back to the Ukraine. Um, so, out, so outside her window, the middle person was a friend who um, uh, was in art therapy court classes. She had can't, and so I love the top, the top panel where she's riding a bicycle and she's not a visual artist, but you know, says I have cancer, but I'm not sick. Um, and then the third person is a cartoonist and she sent me her story. Um, and people had different levels of privacy. Everyone, you know, some people wanted the first names, some people wanted total pseudonyms, some people didn't mind having images that looked like them, other people definitely didn't want to have anything that was recognizable to them, always for reasons that involved family and other people for the most part. I was the only person attached who had both my name and um, first and last name. And, you know, and I had to sort of manage healing in public and also meeting people. And that's like the first thing that they know about you is, is I, the idea of illness, uh, which sort of brings me to navigating towards graphic medicine. Um, and I can talk about that. And then we can take some questions if you want. Um, so I was reading a lot of first person narratives around uh, biographies around illness. And um, Christina Crosby, who died unfortunately in January, uh, has an amazing memoir, A Body Undone, which basically talks about her paralysis after a bicycle accident. And this quote, pain brings with a dour companion loneliness. I feel an unassuageable loneliness because I will never be able to adequately describe the pain I suffer, nor can anyone accompany me into the realm of pain. I've learned that the recourse to analogy is not solely mine since pain is so singular that it evades this uh, direct description, so isolating because in your body alone. And this, quote just completely floored me and was such like a watershed moment for me because in the course of my life I've been on the I've been on the parameter the immediate parameter of invisible uh, dis uh, disability for many many years and I've gotten to really sort of see firsthand and be witness to what does it mean and how and we are an ableist culture and what does it mean to marginalize people because people really do um um, get pushed to the margins. Um, and part of that has to do with, um, if you're interested in this, this is a fantastic book, Arthur Frank's The Wounded Storyteller. Uh, he sort of describes three narratives around illness, um, the restitution narrative, which is the narrative that we're most familiar with. And it sort of basically um, describes health as the norm. Uh, and we may journey into the land of the sick temporarily but then we come back again and we come back whole and medicine has cured us, right? So the, it's, a, it's sort of an institutional narrative and it's an ableist narrative. Um, and the chaos narrative is one that is, is probably the most difficult because it really doesn't ever imagine that things will get better. Uh, and it's a story that's told in the present. And these are the stories that create anxiety for us where they're hard to listen to. And because they're hard to listen to, we don't listen to them. And so they become stories in which you know, we have the official narrative of you get better and, and, and systems make you better. And the chaos narrative, which is your pain is yours alone because it's too great for anybody else to hear. And then the quest narrative is the model in which we sort of look at like, how does somebody own their own narrative? Because the lesson and the story they have to tell can only be told from their perspective uh, and by them. And uh, Arthur Frank talks about this, not necessarily in terms of his own, uh, in terms of his own illness, he talks about survivorship, but he also talks about what it means to be a witness and what it means to sort of give voice to other people's stories as well. And what he calls for with this is what he calls a society in need of a pedagogy of suffering. And like, how do we build a society in which we really think about compassion at the root and thinking about what the role of suffering is, as opposed to sort of making sure that we kind of keep this, this idea of comfort um, and uh, uh, you know, just so that anyone who creates discomfort is almost seen as antisocial, as, as Sarah Schulman says. Um, so right now where my work is sort of centered to be perfectly honest with you um, after this very exhausting year is really thinking about how do we come out of, the, um, of this, this time we're in. Um, 
And I, I think I definitely fall in the category of people when we start talking about going back to normal in quotes, I don't know that normal was so great. <laughs> so like, what does it mean? How do we, how do we, how do we reemerge into something else? And there's um, a fantastic, let me actually, I'm gonna skip ahead uh, to this quote that sort of is guiding it and I'll come back. Uh, there's a fantastic quote by Arundhati Roy where he talks about the pandemic as a portal. Um, and he says, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And so, so part of what I'm thinking about in terms of all this um, is just again, going back to like, what are the different ways we create art and where are the contexts in which we show art and how do we share art, right? And, and, uh, and what are the, and you know, I mean, again, we're, we're, many of these systems are, are capitalist in their basis, right? And so what, is, what does that mean in terms of, uh, of, of the creation of work? And so one of the things I'm working now on, which I'm very excited about, um, uh, is, Around unleashing the power of doodling, I have a collaborator, Jen Leach, who I met at a graphic medicine conference two years ago. She does a lot of work around destigmatizing de uh, mental health and mental illness. And she and I reconnected on Instagram because we found during the pandemic we were sort of compulsively sharing our doodles. Now, and we call them doodles very specifically. Um, so just to give you a sense of what graphic medicine is, graphic medicine is the intersection of the medium of comics or sequential imaging and healthcare. And it's an approach to healthcare um, as, as an interdisciplinary academic form of study. But the thing is about it, it really is about the improvement and, of, and quality of healthcare. It is a social justice movement and it is very, very broad at its basis. And so when I go talked about sort of interdisciplinary um, um, groups, you can imagine a, a, a more interdisciplinary group than this. And um, basically you have healthcare clinicians who think that storytelling and personal narrative and comics are important. You have academics who think that personal and narrative and, and, and comics are important. You have artists who care about stories and other people's stories. And so it's an incredibly open group. And, um, and it's a group that really is looking at social justice around uh, these issues. And so where Jen and I are sort of sitting with it is just really looking at like, what is this practice of doodling and how does that work? And if you look at the def Wikipedia definition of doodling, um, you know, what we what it really comes down to is these notions of like good art versus bad art, good drawing versus bad drawing. So, you know, when you read the definition, it's a scribble often associated with young children and toddlers because of their lack of hand-eye coordination and lower mental development. Um, you know, it's uncommon to see, it's not uncommon to see this in adults, generally done jovially or out of boredom, right? And so it, it's already characterized in a way that basically means that it's not official, it's not good, it's not good art. But we have lots of ways in which we sort of express um, these kinds of drawings. So this is one of Jen's in the margins drawings, uh, doodles. And these were mine during the pandemic. And I thought I wasn't going to share them um, at the time because I was, what you see on the left are, I have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of drawings of these like these. And they're these sort of automatic drawings where I had to compulsively draw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines on a single screen. And I did it while in Zoom meetings and I did it on the train and I did it everywhere. I just had to do it. And while those images of me in a, um, in a hospital gown may look really personal, I was hesitant to post these online simply because I felt like either hey, not my part of my actual real practice, but also they are so much more personal to me in terms of really revealing what my mental health was and my anxiety, because this was entirely about sort of quelling my own anxiety and organizing, like self-organizing. Um, so that's sort of, you know, where I'm at with it now in terms of thinking about like how to empower other people in terms of their creative practice and move forward. And so, um, yes, I hope that we can go through the portal uh, together. And if you have any questions, please speak up. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Marian. All right, so now we'll have uh, a short question and answer period. We're very much almost at the end of our session. I know, I see, has I'm any sorry. Questions <laughs> for, oh, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but if anybody has any questions for Marianne, I have a microphone here. I mean, either about anything that she shared today or work that she has in the exhibition. Um, 
You got a question? All right, Jacqueline has a question. What's one piece of advice that you give all of us students that you would like for us to take away from your presentation today? Um, I th th thank you, Jacqueline. That's a great question. Um, I feel like um, so. There's a few things. One, I think, is to not compare yourself to other people ever. I mean, I can't stress that enough. I feel like often we go, we study art because we want to 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 express ourselves because we have our own individual voice. We have things that we want to share in the world, and then. You go out in the world and you find that there are these official ways to do things or ways that are valued and commodified. And I would just encourage you as much as possible to just really stay true to what interests you at any point. So like there are communities of artists and art practitioners everywhere and they all practice in different ways and their interests are different. And so whether or not you're looking at sort of communities around, you know, uh, relational art, uh, community-based art, educational art, or if you're looking at, you know, the book, the book arts, the paper arts community, the book arts community, there's a million communities out there of artists who don't necessarily know about the other communities out there, right? And you can navigate between many of them depending upon what your interests are. So I would really try to just stay as open as possible to what you're interested in and listen to yourself with that. And don't let other people somehow convince you that what you're interested in might not be of worth in some way. All right, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, do we have any other questions? We have students who are remaining too and listening. So I know you can't see us right now, but <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I have a question about, um, yeah. Kind of like when you when you're and it, this falls back again to like the the prototyping progress process that you have for working mm -hmm. on uh, different projects. Um, do you when you're undertaking the, like the development of New York do you, new work? Do you have mm -hmm. um, multiple ideas and concepts across different? Um, Kind of pursuits like you're looking at say like with mouth and toes that you've been working on are you working on mm -hmm. like multiple projects of these natures oh simultaneous? yeah 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 i have about three or four projects happening at the same time at all times to be honest with you and and what happens with why i like working this way is because most of my projects might take anywhere from six months to two years so when i'm at a point where i'm stuck i just put it away and then i switch towards another thing. So I mean, I have like three projects right now that are sort of overlapping and they're completely different. Like one is about uh, a Norwegian fairy tale, Prince Lindworm, that I'll return to this summer. I have another piece that's a collective narrative piece around violent loss and murder. And they're, they're equally important to me, um, but they're just sort of in parallel and different stages of development where Prince Lindworm's like at 50% and the, the, the violent loss piece is at 25%. And you know, that's, that's sort of how I, I do things. All right. Um, well, I think we're we're getting ready. I don't know if anybody else has any questions, um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Uh, we're really thank happy to so have much. you uh, present and then also to have your exhibition in the Art Center. So let's have I'm everybody thrilled. just give Mariana a hand again and thank her for coming. And if anyone ever wants to email me, show me what you're working on, has a question, please don't hesitate to reach out. Certainly. Thank you again. Um, okay. So have a have a wonderful day and good luck with uh, you too. And have a great weekend. Yes. Pandemic education. <laughs> I'm actually about to hop onto a class right now. So I'll see you soon. Then. <laughs> well, we won't we won't keep you any further. Thank you again very okay. much. I'll be bye in bye. Touch. Thank you. Bye.